All right, I'll start right now then. Thank you, thank you so much everyone for coming. We're good to go, we're hearing, great, wonderful. So this is a introduction to QGIS presented by myself, Dave Rodriguez, and my colleague, Matt Hunter. Um, gotta click on the thing. Uh, yes, if you are looking at this later, uh, you can follow this link here, uh, bit.ly slash FSU underscore intro to QGIS. Um, and uh, everything that uh, we show today is there. If you want to come back later and do these exercises at, at your own time is face, at your own time and play, pace, uh, please do that. That's what they're there for. Uh, you should be able to kind of do this uh, at your convenience. Uh, you don't need to be here live with us right now. Um, and if you act, there we go. Um, so this is who this is who we are. I'm Dave Rodriguez. This is my colleague Matt Hunter. Uh, we work in the Office of Digital Research and Scholarship over in Strozier Library. Um, should you have any questions or want to use QGIS or any sort of spatial uh, software, uh, QGIS software in your up coming projects, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us. We we provide consultations, we can help with training, we can help with troubleshooting, um, you know, consider us your resource. So if you need help, if you feel like you want to use this in a project now or any time in the, in, um, in the uh, upcoming future, uh, that's what we're there for. Um, so what we're going to do today, uh, just to give you an overview, is we're going to provide you with an overview of GIS software. Uh, some of the main concepts that go along with creating maps. Um, we'll talk to you about how to install QGIS on your computer. And then we're going to um, devote a good chunk of time to just doing a, um, doing a, uh, doing some practice uh, exercises and doing lots of examples to get you comfortable using QGIS and all of the sort of like functionality that comes with it. We're also going to give you um, lots of links to other further resources and such. And then at the end of this, uh, if you want, we'll have probably at least a half an hour or so to uh, troubleshoot, install, uh, do some experimenting and all of that um, should you so desire. So. Some of the things we're not going to do today, because this is an introductory workshop, is we're not going to talk about how GIS data sets are created. This is very involved um, and beyond this sort of scope of what we can do today. We're not going to talk about um, how to sort of judge which ones are good or not, because again, this is pretty like discipline specific. Um, and we're also not going to talk about ArcGIS, which you may have heard. Arc GIS is a very expensive proprietary uh, system that is basically, uh, and QGIS is essentially the free and open source version of that. Um, you can do lots of stuff with QGIS still. It's a great piece of software, but it is supported by uh, a community of users that uh, create resources and support the existence of the software out of the goodness of their hearts. Uh, it's not a commercial product uh, the way that Arc GIS is. Um, and we'll also, we won't, talk about like how to like host this stuff online. But if you have questions about any of these things, uh, we can always answer those questions for you uh, later at a separate time. Um, so the first thing we'll do is talk about how to install QGIS. Um, if you'd like to follow a a a along with us today, which is not required, um, like I said, you can always go back and uh, do all of these examples um, at your own time and pace. Um, what you'll be able to do is start the installation like now, and um, and then while uh, Matt uh, talks to you about some uh, some of the concepts uh, related to working with GIS data, uh, you should be able to get that installation completed. And then of course at the end we'll have time at the end of the presentation for us to. Uh, work on that as well should you need it. Um, so to install QJS, pretty straightforward how you would install lots of other software as you would find on the internet. Go to the go to the um, website which is QGIS.org and then download the application based on the operating system that you're using. Um, a couple of notes here, um, if you're using a, a, um, a, um, a, um, a Windows 
OS, you'll see that there are two options to do a standalone or a network installation. Use the standalone one. It's just easier unless you have a good reason to or you kind of know what you're are doing. Uh, we recommend you using the standalone um, in, in installation process. Um, also, so some notes on sort of like versions. As of now, which is uh, for the sake of it's March 2019. Um, the newest version of QGIS is, is uh, 3.6. For the purposes of this tutorial and for uh, learning QGIS, we would recommend you go with the long-term stable release, which is version 3.4. Um, it has a bit less functionality than the brand new version, but for the purposes of today, you're not going to need any of that fancy um, sort of like new stuff. If you want to, hey Sarah, um, if you want to, you know, sort of uh, see what those differences are or you feel like you need that higher um, set of like functionality like later, uh, you can always go back uh, and reinstall uh, it as that. Um, so as of now, uh, for everyone who's like wants to begin the installation process, are you good? Do you need a second? Is everything all right? Yes, bro. How do I know? Um, that would, the, you would have to look that up on your system settings. How new is your computer? I think yours is going to be 64. Yours is 64. Yeah. yeah. 64. Those are those like Dell books that all of the library staff get. Yeah. They're 64. Yeah. 32 is probably like anything 2010 and prior. There may be a chance, um, the new processor architecture. Yeah. And if you're on a Mac, if you click that Apple and you click the A out my Mac button, um, and then if you go to the option, I, th I think there's an option for processor, and it'll tell you if you have a 64 or a 32-bit. Most newer Apple, yeah, I mean, like, Apple's been 64-bit for, for, like, a while now, yeah. so. But are there any other questions before we move forward? Looking at this stuff. Yeah, and again, if, you, if you're having issues, you know, we can always come back at the end uh, and, um, you know, at by the end of 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 today, uh, you'll certainly be able to have it installed on your computer and up and running should you should you need be. So with that, I'll hand it off to Matt here, who's going to talk to a little bit more about QGIS versus ArcGIS and introduce some mapping concepts as well. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Matt Hunter. I'm the digital scholarship technologist at FSU Libraries in the Office of Digital Research and Scholarship, as Dave already said. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is just sort of general mapping concepts that will apply to GIS software. So it's a little bit about the, the differences between um, conceptual ideas of cartography versus mapping and then also how that relates to the data structures that underlie them. Um, so as Dave already sort of mentioned, what we're going to be talking about today is QGIS, which is the free and open source version of ArcGIS, which is kind of the industry standard. Um, personal licenses are cheap-ish, they're about $100 per year uh, for a personal license, but beyond that, beyond the sort of basic functionality, they are prohibitively expensive, and that's why QGIS gives you all of the same features that you would probably need unless you know that you need ArcGIS for free. Um, if you get into sort of like industry standard type things, you're, you're going to know that you need to use ArcGIS at a certain point, um, and then at that stage, um, there are definitely, th there's a lot of resources out there that come when you get an ArcGIS subscription. Um, <clears throat> but moving on, what we're going to talk about now is sort of very quick primer on geospatial data and um, sort of concepts and issues related to that. So audience participation time. Can anybody tell me what these are? Can anybody see what those are on these monitors? Sorry. <laughs> Okay, we got some squigglies on the left and then some other squigglies on the right. Anybody want to hazard a guess? No? Brood doesn't want to hazard a guess. He's shaking his head. <laughs> Sarah, can you give me a guess? They are maps. Do those look like maps to anybody else? No? Okay, well what if I told you the maps, two of them, on the left, are based on islands and fjords in, uh, I want to say Greenland, based off indigenous peoples that carved little pieces of driftwood so that they knew, okay, you're going to move a short distance followed by an island, 
uh, or you're going you're gonna to see an island, and then there's going to be a short distance, and then there's going to be a bigger island that's got two peaks on it, and then you're going to go a uh, slightly shorter distance, and there's going to be two bumps, which are going to be two islands. So that's how, you, and what's kind of interesting is they're, they're probably about palm-sized, so you can hold them in a mittened finger and still be able to feel them. So as you're paddling, you can kind of tell where you need to go, and you sort of have a reference. Um, and that's, that's a ge geological representation map could be a bunch of different things, but that serves as a way to represent the Earth in the way it exists. Uh, what about the one on the right? Anybody? I'll give you a clue. It's in a presentation about maps and geospatial data. The thing on the left is a map. Anybody want to say it's a map? Okay, you're almost right. Trick question. Uh, <laughs> It is actually a representation of a song that the Australian Aboriginal people sing and are reminded of when they see this artwork. Um, depicting the land is actually culturally insensitive to the culture that this comes from, and so you don't represent the land because the, the land is sort of um, imbued with divine um, being. Um, so you can't actually depict it because it's profane to do so, but what you do is you look at this representation of a song that is sung to call into being a journey. Um, and so that, that picture on the right is actually just a representation of the song as interpreted by um, an artist. So again, they're not maps in the way that we think of, okay, here's north, here's south, here's east and west, and here are distances and roads and things like that. It's not an atlas, but it's still a concept of putting direction and feature and, and distance onto a physical form. So, as we're thinking about that then, what does the term geospatial data mean, right? So you're thinking about, I'm going to nerd out a little bit in my classics background, ge, meaning earth, meaning the dirt earth, but capital earth we think of as the planet and the way that the, the land is situated. So geospatial data has something to do with the earth and the physical sort of realm on which we walk and the stuff that we walk on each day. Uh, spatial, it's sort of talking about the relationship between other things in relation to, a, from one thing to another thing or many things. So there's like the, the sense of space and the sense of physicality about things. And then we're also thinking about data, which is some form of a measured thing, right? So it, it's, it's got to be um, information gleaned from the world at large that you give um, matter to. So what about this? How, how much of, now we're starting to get into more map looking things, right? So this is the, uh, the, the Tabula Poitingeriana, which is a map showing distances from the city of Rome created in, I want to say the fourth century, uh, between the fourth, first and fourth century. Um, and so what this actually is, is not a representation of how far it is on the Italian peninsula, which is north to south here. I don't, let me see if I can move. I'm going to move this way. Uh, so this is the Italian peninsula, this is Rome, this is the port, um, portus. And what you're actually looking at is all of these little segments of line are labeled with a Roman mile marker. So you know that you're going to travel 10 miles between Rome and the next fork of the road. But it's more of like an atlas, like the AAA road atlases that you could have gotten back, probably still now, I don't know, I haven't used one. <laughs> Yeah, they still make them? Okay, all right. Um, but so this, this is a map of distances and sort of landmarks as you travel on you know, whatever region you want to go to. Uh, so, so we're starting to get into more of what we think of as maps as concepts for wayfinding and sort of like distance traveling and sort of referential. Um, and up in the top right, you sort of see the, the red highlight box. That's the only part that we're looking at. This thing is huge, but it's all laid out in terms of you know, east-west and sort of thinking of like latitude, um, we're, we're thinking of it east-west. So we're only really looking at a small section near the middle, and this goes through the entirety of the Roman Empire in the first to fourth century. So you're looking at, you know, all the way up to uh, uh, Scotland is on there, the Isle of Skye is on there, and then it goes all the way down into um, northern Africa and like into the Sahara, which is kind of really cool, and then you got like the eastern deserts of like Asia and Asia Minor and things like that. So. Um, a lot of information contained on this map that isn't in a form that we think of, but it's still kind of close comparatively to the, the little mitten um, driftwood. So now 
when we think of maps, this is similar to what we think of, right? So you got the US and you got roads and you got you know blue for the ocean, you got ground color for the ground, um, and you got roads and you got labels for cities and things like that. Um, so this is one of two main types of maps. So right now we're looking at reference maps. And so it's you sort of, you look at a representation of the physical world and you reference it to find out information about other things. So now you want to look at, okay, well, what's the easiest way to get from New Jersey down to Miami? Well, it's I-95, just like everybody else that goes down there. Um, so that's something that you can look at this map and see, right? So you sort of think, okay, I'm going to put these two points together and then I'm going to look at the thing that connects them and that's what I'm looking for. Um, and then there's another type, which is a thematic map, which is, uses the framework of physicality and space and, and like, geospatial reference to present another form of data. So here we look at uh, plant hardiness, and so these are zones uh, um, demarcated by the USDA that's talking about what plants might be good and might survive in these different areas um, as determined by various different regions and zones and things like that. So what you're given is you're given a rough outline of the US with state lines um, sort of insinuated on it, but then what you're really being presented is these multiple different colors which show a range of plant hardiness, which is a, a scale determined by the USDA. Um, so you're not looking at the physical features of a thing necessarily, you're looking at data overlaid on what happens to be a quick referential framework that you should, you know, hopefully should understand if it's a, a well-presented um, visualization. So now that we've talked about the two general types of maps, we're going to talk about some general types of geospatial data. Um, and so this map here, what does it look like the key feature that it is trying to portray to you? Like, what is the data on this map? That is really blurry, I'm sorry. Uh, generally. Yeah, yeah, you know, so like stuff in that place. Right? So it's not, it's not super useful because like, okay, well what's out here in Baja, California? Uh, planes and uh, uh, battleships and fish and then like miners, I guess, over in um, the, the northern tip of uh, Baja, California. And then you got some redwoods. Okay, well there's mountains a bunch and then there's potatoes and then what's in Canada? Ice and mountain Mounties. Okay, is it tourism? Is it agricultural products? Is it, you know, resources, it's a little bit of everything, but it's referential, right? So you sort of look at it and you're like, oh, okay, I get a general sense of some of the things that are around here. Uh, anybody notice anything that's um, not on here? So thinking about data and what data, so, so Dave mentioned that we're not gonna be talking about how you make data sets for geographical maps. I'm going to just a little bit, but uh, so, so some of the data that's missing from this map, from what you'd expect. Right, okay, yeah, so you have no idea that that Mountie is in Saskatchewan, right? So you don't know that, there's no label for that. What about, you know, like where we are in Florida, what's, what do we got going on, I don't know, a dance? I have no idea what that is, actually, I should have looked at that. I don't know, I hope that's not, is it? Yeah. Okay. Ah, there you go. Okay, yeah, we uh, we have Marilyn Monroe, kind of a Marilyn Monroe surrogate down in Fort Lauderdale, West Palm, Miami area. Okay, well, what about Alaska? What about Hawaii? Yeah, well, this map was produced in what does it say, fifty-seven? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, it was produced in nineteen forty-two. Alaska wasn't a state until nineteen fifty-two. Hawaii was in fifty-nine. Uh, the artist here, Carubius. Covarubias uh, died in 57, so he would have been able to do Alaska, but not Hawaii. But on this map, no Alaska, no Hawaii. So your data set that you're pulling from doesn't have information about Alaska and Hawaii because it wasn't included in the states, I guess, which is the point of this. Um, so here, right? So if we're thinking about like maps and geospatial data, this is sort of what everybody thinks of, right? Like you got a general shape of a land mass and then you got a bunch of colors on it in like weird abstract shapes. And it looks sort of like modern art, but you know, what are you looking at here? Well, this is a, a two variable map looking at food, uh, food scarcity and obesity, 
right? So you're looking at a darker shade being a more likely occurrence of both of those things. And it's presented on a geospatial framework, right? So you're looking at the, the, the contiguous US, because again, you don't see Alaska or Hawaii on this one, but you're looking at the contiguous US and you're looking at where do these things happen? And that's sort of an inferred third layer of data, right? So you're looking at, okay, well, where is there a high prevalence of obesity and high food scarcity? So low availability of good food. Well, you sort of know, mm, that's kind of in the South. That's kind of in, you know, um, the, the, um, Gulf Coast states, right? So you're like, you're looking at a lot of this stuff and you can kind of infer, well, what else do I know about the US that would kind of infer this to make additional meaning? So that's what you're doing with uh, geospatial maps. You're sort of like implying another layer of data without stating it, um, which can be useful. It can also be misleading, so kind of keep an eye out on that. So thinking of presenting data and inferring uh, or implying other data, you can also present data on a spatial grid and infer data from it. So this is one of the earliest uh, geospatial data visualizations. So this is from a, um, a study done by a uh, surgeon, John Snow, not the one that's going to be really famous starting next month. Um, but it's, uh, it was produced in 1855, and this was about an investigation the surgeon was doing on trying to figure out why cholera was breaking out in a certain little section of London. So what he did is those little, these dark lines right here are stacked instances of cholera per household. So he walked around like a whole bunch of blocks and he sort of like, how many people have cholera in your household? Okay, thank you very much. How many people have cholera in your household? Thank you very much. Um, and so what he did is he gridded this onto a city map of London. And what you're looking at is uh, there is a, uh, all the streets, the buildings, and then the instances of cholera. And then there's another, um, circles. So there's one over here and there's one here and uh, I forget where the bad one is. I think it's sort of like right here. Um, city water pumps. So this is back in the day where if, in order to get water you'd take your pail and you'd go out to the pump and you'd get a bucket of it and you'd come back to your house. Well apparently one of the pumps was infected with cholera somehow and so everyone within the radius of that pump had a higher likelihood of catching cholera than did others away from that pump. So it's sort of like this cross examination of um, symptoms resulting in a finding. Um, and that was done based on portraying this on a geographical grid. So that's pretty cool. Um, but then you gotta be careful though, right? So we talked about why was that one, you know, why was the, uh, the, the food scarcity map some, not misleading, but not a complete picture? Well, it didn't have Hawaii and it didn't have Alaska. I'd be really interested to figure out, okay, well, what is the sort of population and obesity in Hawaii and Alaska? Because I know there's some really interesting data there too. So what do you do when the physical land size of a map is detrimental to a fair and accurate representation of your data? Well, you don't have to present it as exactly the way that you would expect a geographical representation to be. So up here we have these things called cartograms and on the top left, sorry, on the top left you have a shrinking of land mass based on population density. So you sort of see the Dakotas are shrunk down to what would be equal in land mass if they were as equal in population to, say, South Florida or New England. So, um, you know, up in the New York area, it's very... Um, overinflated or sort of like bulging because there are so many people per square mile. But in the Dakotas, it's very small because there are very few people per square mile. So this is sort of visually a better representation of population density that has nothing to do with square footage and territory of a geographic representation that you would otherwise expect. Similarly, down on the bottom right, you're looking at a cartogram that uh, portrays the um, uh, electoral, yeah, electoral college votes per state. So we always say like, oh, Florida's a swing state, but you know, compared to Texas on a lot of maps, it's a lot smaller, but then you look, okay, well, the Texas chunk 
is sort of right here and the Florida chunks over here and like those are all hexagons and you can sort of go through and count on a, on a higher quality map you can sort of see the differentiations but you can sort of see that landmass wise Texas California Florida are big ish but they're a lot bigger than somewhere like um, I don't know New Jersey right so New Jersey's tiny but look how many hexagons that has based on votes so that's something that you can also portray if you take liberties with the physical or the representation of the physical to better fit your data so again what are you trying to show are you trying to show land mass are you trying to show electoral college votes what if you're trying to be very readable and the only thing you care about is showing the linearity of subway stops what if you only really need to know you're on green line you come to this stop and then if you continue on green line you're going to go to this stop well you don't have to match up with the actual physical geography of the city of london so you know the purple line goes all the way out here in reality but on the subway map you can shrink it down and you just say like eh, it's the last stop you know it's out on a branching part it's it's farther than the rest of them so this this idea of abstraction you're not beholden to making everything geographically faithful but as long you, you can do that as long as your data supports a presentation in a different way or it would be more meaningful for your data to present be presented in that way uh, this is one of my favorite ones it's a data visualization showing napoleon's march into uh, moscow in um 1860 i'm sorry 1812 it was a data visualization presented uh created in 1869. so what this is showing is um, a march from uh, a, a city in Poland all the way over to Moscow in red that is the army that left in black is the army that came back and you can sort of see as that army or as that line the width shrinks there are less soldiers um, and what you're seeing is you're sort of seeing six things so this isn't quite a map it's a data visualization that has a geographic influence on it it's not a map showing you the roads you would take between these two cities but what you're seeing is the number of troops which is the width of the column the distance generally you're sort of seeing like there is a distance between this place and this place and it is shorter or longer than the distance between this other place and this other other place you're also seeing temperature which you kind of can't see but this bottom half of the graph which is part of the the visualization is actually showing the degrees below zero and the lot there are some lines that I really wish you could see this it's really cool there are some lines that line up to like various different dates that are in here and so you can sort of see this graph shows that down here it's like negative 30 and so you can see from there to here there's a large decrease in troop number which is pretty cool to look at so you're looking at um Number of troops, distance, temperature, a direction of travel, right? So generally east-ish towards Moscow and generally west-ish away from Moscow. Um, you're looking at location relative to specific dates. So there are some date lines on there as well. And you get um, a general sense of longitude and latitude. So you have gen these are being presented not in the, the um, order of stops and places people went, but sort of generally west to east and then east to west, north and south. So you sort of start down here and you go generally up towards Moscow. That's not accurate in terms of how distant it is um, latitude wise, but it is generally referencing that Moscow is more north of the place that they started. Um, so it's, again, it, it's more important to the visual aspect of it to present it that way than it is to be accurate in the geographical thing. So again, the same data that you have can be misleading if you don't present it in a way that makes the best fit for that data. So the thing that you're presenting has to be um, as fair to your representation as possible. So these are all based on the same underlying data set, um, adjusted in various different ways to show six different things, really. So this top left one, you're looking at winners overall of election votes red being democratic red i'm sorry blue being democratic red being republican so that is the winner of the state overall down here you're having a winner of the state resized so that um 
electoral votes are given equal land mass. So you, again, you shrink the Dakotas and you sort of like increase um, New England, so you sort of have a better re visual representation of the larger a red thing is in this just means the state's larger. The larger a red thing here means there is more of a red thing going on, so more votes. Over here, you break it down by county. And again, by county by land mass, by county by population. And over here, you even shade it number of votes. So the more red a thing is, the more Republican it voted, the more blue a thing is, the more Democratic it voted, the more purple, the more about even it was. But down here, again, this is sort of the best picture for that. So it shows, uh, based on popular vote, how many people voted for a thing and how much, how many votes were there for that thing. So you sort of shrink down the places that had fewer votes because it doesn't really matter how much vote by land area um, that um, grouping of data is less important than the number itself. Um, <clears throat> so as you're thinking about that, the data that you have, you also have to be aware that the map itself can be changed because they're, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to represent a round object on a flat plane, right? So the, the sphere of the globe cannot be represented on a flat plane accurately. So there's going to be some skew of that representation. So two different pro uh, things called projections are shown here. And one uh, is the Gall-Peterson map, which gives um, relative area as the, the prominent thing that they are trying to show accurately. And the Mercator shows distance and direction. So it's more for sailing and like flying and things like that. So you have a better representation of east, west, north, south than you do land size. Uh, and this is just sort of a, a general um, recapitulation of that theme. You sort of see how the roundness and the squareness affects the presentation of something like a head, right? So a normal human head looks a certain way, but then as you project it onto different um, coordinate grid systems, uh, it skews that. And so what you're looking at on the right is sort of the same representation or different representations of the same thing, which happens to be the contiguous US, uh, based on uh, coordinate reference systems which are given various different identifying numbers based on what you're trying to align them to. So are you aligning them to a true north, south, east, west grid? Or are you aligning them to a grid that's more curved so it better represents a sphere um, or things like that? And Dave will talk about CRS just a little bit as we get into um, setting up maps in QGIS. Um, and I think this is back to you. Sure. Yeah. Cool. So, so thanks, Pat. Um, so, before we actually start getting around um, and exploring in QGIS, we'll just talk a little bit about the kinds of data um, that you're actually going to be encountering and actually sort of like working with. Um, so we'll talk about two, two kinds of data, vector data and raster data, and uh, the um, sort of what each of these kinds of data are like used for. And we'll also talk about shape files, which are sort of the common file format that you're going to encounter counter with using QGIS. So first let's talk about uh, 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 vector data. So anything that's a vector is basically geometrical features on a map. Um, and these are sort of the most, these are so simple you may even forget to even consider them. So these are, so these are essentially like points, lines, and uh, shapes. Um, uh, lines are also called arcs sometimes in GIS world. Um, and the three of these are used to uh, represent different kinds of features on a map. And we'll also talk about rasters and what raster data uh, can be used for as well, as then it often goes hand in hand. Um, so the point. Point is perhaps the most simple and common uh, type of data. Um, points can be used to represent anything from trees to a lamppost to an entire city, uh, depending on the, um, the scale of your map in question. Uh, a point can be thought of as just any uh, intersection between two or more uh, axes. Then, then you have lines. Lines are just a series of points, right? Um, but the thing that makes a line unique is that the first and the, the, first and the last point are not the same, i.e. It, it 
doesn't inform a, it does not form a, a, an enclosed shape. Um, so lines, unsurprisingly, represent um, linear features, things like uh, roads, rivers, flight paths, uh, contour lines on a contour map, which um, represents different areas of um, elevation. Then um, polygons or shapes, right? And these are simply lines that 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 do form an enclosed shape. Uh, these are these can sort of represent any discrete area from a field, a park, a building, a country, a state, a county, whatever. Any sort of in enclosed discrete area. Um, and uh, oftentimes these features uh, share. Uh, points and uh, axes with each other as well. Um, so while vector data represents the real world uh, with these three with these three um, geometrical features that we just talked about, raster data represents the world as a grid, um, where each sort of cell of that grid uh, has some piece of information attached to it. Um, often you'll see raster data as the like, base map of something. Um, the most common raster uh, data set you're probably uh, have all seen before is the raw satellite view uh, from uh, Google Maps. Um, and without any other sort of like notation on it, that's a, um, that's a sort of uh, common example of, of, of a of like very high resolution raster data. So here's an example that probably looks pretty familiar to a lot of you. Um, and you'll also notice that there's point data overlaying uh, this like raster data. And so if you zoom in, like we see on this image on your right here, uh, you can see that this map is just a grid of pixels, right? And um, with each square uh, uh, represents something uh, pertaining to that actual area of ground. Um, you can also use raster data to to represent more abstract information, so such as like elevation or temperature. So this is a, an example of something called a DEM, or a digital <laughs> elevation map, which with um, each of these like squares, or uh, cells rather, uh, represents a 30 meter by 30 meter span of ground uh, with an elevation value that's a, a attached to that cell shaded in these various uh, degrees of like red and pink here. So the most common file format that you're going to come across when you're dealing with data is called a shape file. And shape files pertain only to, um, to um, to uh, um, they don't pertain to raster data sets, only to um, sort of like vectors. Um, but each each uh, shape file is is actually a group of files. It's really shape file. The name is kind of a misnomer. It sh should be more of a shape directory um, because inside of these directories, the .shp file, that's the actual thing that gets drawn. That's the actual geometry. Whereas all these other um, sidecar files have, have information that are, that are or like needed for that actual drawing to like render properly inside of QGIS. Um, and so the examples that we're going to look at today and the data sets that, that are included here, um, all of these like shape files are like all formed already. You, you just have to like download them and uh, save them somewhere on your computer. And like I said, we're not going to go into how all these get created today, but these are just so you know this is what all of these files in your shape file directory um, are actually doing. So uh, a quick note, so a lot of the training material that you'll find out in this like, world uses QGIS 2. We're going to be using QGIS 3. Um, these, anything you find for any sort of training uh, things you find for QGIS 2 are probably going to be applicable fine. They're, they just won't actually look the same and some things will be have slightly different names. So for example, there's a tab in QGIS 2 called style, which in QGIS 3 is called uh, symology because someone got a 
thesaurus for Christmas, I'm guessing. Um, so uh, just small things like that, but just sort of be aware that if you're looking at um, a tutorial or something that is using QGIS2, it's not going to look exactly the same uh, as uh, if you're running an instance of QGIS3. Um, so uh, now it's time, if you have downloaded it, uh, to open up QGIS and um, the rest of the tutorial is just screenshots. So if you need to come back to this and go through these step by steps again, uh, you, you can do that. Everything here is just screenshots. So uh, you can kind of like re recreate what what we have here on your own screen and uh, you know learn more about how to use this software. So this is sort of just your kind of like basic walk around the interface. Once you open, you have your toolbars with all of your tools and commands and such. You have your browser where you can actually like go into your computer and like find like shape files and such. You have your list of layers, which is how, which is, um, uh, which will include everything that's in your like canvas. And then some information that you can't really see clearly on the, on the, uh, on the lower right hand side of your screen about scale, the like, magnification, the like rotation, and the PRS. So the CRS is a coordinate reference system. And I'm not going to say too much about this because this is where like things get very complicated when you're dealing um, with uh, using sort of a, with any kind of GIS software. But essentially, a, any kind of map data that you use is going to conform to or use something, some kind of coordinate reference system. And this is sort of a key as to how, how the information gets rendered on screen on a two-dimensional plane. There are thousands of coordinate um, reference systems that are all kind of dependent upon where and how the particular map was made. Um, you could, we could spend a whole other 90 minute tutorial just talking about all the different kinds of CRSs. Um, what you need to keep in mind and what you need to, to take away from this tutorial is that if you're using different shape files, they should all have the same PRS. So everything overlays properly. Um, that's the key of like thing there. Um, once you actually start getting into doing more serious um, sort of like mapping applications, you may need to learn a little bit more about how and why one CRS should be used over um, like another. But for now, just know that it's a thing and uh, um, all of your sort of like shape files it should, uh, should all be using uh, the same coordinate reference system. Uh, so let's make a map now. So everything else from here on out is like again, just like... Um, Let's take screenshots and uh, we'll be able to sort of like go through step by step how to make some maps. So for the first case study, we're going to be looking at 311 service requests from New York City from the year 2016. Uh, all of this information was provided uh, from this um, workshop link here. You can, um, you can go to that link and uh, find all of their in information on it. This is um, the... the this is a long but incredibly useful tutorial. Um, when they gave this training, it was like a full day. Uh, I don't think you need a full day to complete it, um, but it's very, very useful. Um, and then there are also links here to uh, the data sets that we'll be or like using. We're going to look at the actual like um, uh, information about the ge geography of the like, city. Also, we'll be looking at um, information about specific 311 service requests. Um, so in order to uh, work with these, just uh, download them. They're both like zip files and then just save them somewhere convenient on your computer. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to up, uh, upload our shape file uh, of the five, um, five, um, of, uh, of the five, uh, five parts of New York boroughs they're called, the five boroughs of New York. So what you'll want to do, and again, I'm sorry for the quality of this projection, uh, you'll navigate to our shape files um, uh, either in your browser or you'll hit control L or go to this layer button, add layer, um, whichever one you prefer. It's basically three ways of getting to the same spot where you would add a layer, 
browse your computer or, or browse the directory where you downloaded uh, the uh, data sets, uh, find the .shp file, click add, and there you go. We've got our five boroughs. Um, and you'll and you'll and you'll 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 um, you'll you'll see on our on our uh, on our like layers list that we now have one layer. We now have one layer of uh, shapefile data. And uh, your color may not look like this. Uh, QGIS assigns random colors, but let's change that. Um, so let's say you wanted to color these. Um, you know, you wanted all of Queens to be to be colored one way uh, um, all of, and all of the other sections to be colored um, their own unique um, colors as well. So let's first look at the underlying uh, data. So you would right click on that layer and go to open attribute table and you see we've got some helpful uh, identifying information here that, that we can uh, use uh, uh, to color code uh, our five parts of New York. Um, so then you would right click on the layer again and look at its properties um, and then make sure you're on this uh, symbology tab um, and you would change uh, our drop down uh, uh, um, our drop down toolbar from the top from single symbol to categorized and then you would change the column uh, drop down to the name of uh, the, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, you can't read any of this, but you would change the column name to the, to, uh, the name of uh, the name of the column that we're going to pull from the attribute table, um, and then click this classify button, and then this will create uh, the five classifications uh, based on information from that attribute table, then click OK. And now we have our color-coded five boroughs of New York. Um, so now let's say we wanted to add like labels to these. So we would navigate back to our properties of the of the uh, of that particular layer again, just by like right right clicking or control clicking on that layer. Um, navigate to the labels tab this time, and then we would just want to assign single labels uh, to be. Um, to be filled with information that 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 we're going to pull from that name column. So we're just pulling information from this column, and we're saying assign this information to a specific label. And then we would do that, and now we have uh, a nicely labeled map. Um, but you can see that they're styled kind of weird, like the maps are, or the like the like labels are kind of like off center. The one for um, Manhattan's kind of like running into the like hedge there. So we can stylize that a bit and make it a little bit more presentable. Navigate back to your labels tab. Um, select the select the placement option and click free slow in parentheses, um, and this positions the label to be more kind of in line with the overall geometry of the like, vector shape. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, just like have a note that you can always go back in any point uh, throughout this process and like change how these labels look and, um, and like render. You can edit the colors, the font sizes, things like that as well. So now you've got a nice... Uh, map of the city laid out, a nice uh, single shape layer. So now we're going to add a layer and we're going to add this, uh, th this, um, these, uh, these uh, 311 service requests. So we would follow the same steps as before. And then uh, you'll see that our new layer comes on top of the old one. So note that when you're adding layers, QGIS automatically puts the, 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 the most recent layer on top, um, and the order that they're stacked in your like layers list does make a difference. So if you were, so if you had our, so if we had our first shape file on top of this, the all of these points would be uh, obscured. So we just so just like always like be aware of the like order of this list. Um, and so, as you can see, there are lots of points 
of data here. So let's look at the attribute table and try to make some meaning out of these. Um, so yeah, I don't think you can read any of this on this projector, um, but I'll tell you that there's about 4,300 rows. So there's 4,300 unique points and 53 columns of <laughs> information right there. So let's, let's like drill down into this and see if we can sort of like filter out uh, some of this so we only see data that's like pertinent to us. So we do this by creating a query. And how you create a query is you would start, you would, you would right click a layer and go to this filter option. And this opens our query constructor. And in, in this new sort of like window, um, we can, we see all of the like pertinent fields that are from our attribute table or those, um, it'll display all those columns. Um, and then if you were to click on these and then view the all, uh, you would see everything, all of these like values that are associated will hit those columns. And then we have um, a field down here on the lower part of the screen where we can create an expression that will, that, that will only collect a certain uh, subset of that data. So for the purposes of this example, we're going to look at just data points pertaining to broken um, Mooney meters. Um, so we will uh, basically just, uh, you can follow these instructions, you can select the pertinent column, click all to see uh, which one is there, uh, collect that, and um, then use, uh, use some of these operators down here, which have like things like equal than to, greater than, less than, not equal to, um, and basically have it say, um, create an expression where it says complaint equals broken meter, and then uh, you can test and apply that filter. And you can see when you test your query, you get 515 rows coming back. So we've taken our 4,300 original data points, and now we're only gonna see 515 data points because we've built a query to like only show us one subset of that data. So let's say we wanted to, uh, to have this even more sort of like narrow down. Let's say we just wanted to look at broken um, things in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, so we would just go back to our query builder. Um, we could keep our, our original query at the and operator um, and uh, add the or additional criteria of the um, of taking the. Uh, a row field and saying equals Brooklyn. And now we see when we test it, we get 121 columns, or I'm sorry, 121 rows, not columns. Um, and then we can return to our map and now it's only going to show us broken um, Mooney meters in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, we've zoomed in a bit here just to sort of like clarify. Um, and if you notice, because you've used that, that, that free um, labeling feature, the name of, uh, 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 or, uh, the, um, the, the, like, labels will actually shift, uh, depending on your, um, on the, like, scale of your map. So, let's stylize this even further, because those little yellow dots, even, you know, even not on this bad screen uh, are kind of hard to see. So just like with our original layer, um, we can go back, open up a layer and choose how, how it's going to, um, how it's going to like look. So we can uh, right click on our 311 layer, uh, go to properties, then symbology, and then format um, how these like little points uh, actually look on our map. Um, and there's lots of options here. You can add um, all sorts of like layers of richness and meaning. Um, and then here's our nice new uh, broken, uh, broken um, Mooney meter map of Brooklyn uh, with um, a lot more sort of easily distinguishable sort of like data. So another useful tool is using um, is uh, is 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 using this identify features function, which is up at the top toolbar. Um, basically, you can uh, click on a specific point, and it will show you all of the like data that that is associated. Um, will hit that point um, just by clicking on it without having to like open up the attribute table.
or anything like that. So all good. We have our nice map, our nice shapes, points, and vectors. Um, but what's the big thing that's not here? What's missing here? If you're if you're actually trying to like use this map to like go and like actually like find these like broken things, for instance. Could you like hop in your car and like drive around like Brooklyn and like find all these things? No, right? Yeah, yeah. There's no roads. There's no reference, right? These are just shapes. These are these are it's like vectors. So how we can do this is we could go in and just have to draw all of the roads in <laughs> New York City, but that would be very difficult and take a very, very long time. But because QGIS is a lovely piece of software, we can import an underlying raster layer, raster layer using a plugin called Open Layers in QGIS. So this particular plugin does not come with QGIS. And like lots of things with QGIS, you have to install the plugin on your own. So to do this, it's not super complicated. You would go to the plugins option, uh, option plugins, um, then you would just do the uh, install. Um, and then the first thing you would need to do is go to settings and make sure you're getting all the experimental and deprecated plugins because a lot of things are considered experimental in QGIS 3 just because it's new, um, even though they weren't experimental in QGIS 2. Um, so just make sure that's uh, collected. And then you would just find the plugin that you would want. In this case, it's open layers. Install the thing. It takes a second. And then you would, um, and then to add it, you would just go up to the top and say, uh, you would select the open layers plugin and then add the uh, open street map. And then it shows up and it loads. But then everything we've seen before, all of our points, all of our shapes, everything is gone. The street map just overlays it. Why? What happened here? What do we have to do in order to make sure that we can see everything that we just made plus this underlying reference layer? Anyone know? Yes, Matt. Increase the transparency or reduce the opacity of the layer so we can see multiple one step ahead of me, Sorry. but reorder the layers. Reorder the layers. Very good. Very <laughs> good. So recall, um, QGIS cares the order of your stack of layers here. So something at the like very top is going to obscure everything that's underneath it. The three one one calls that's just like point data. So that's not going to obscure your shapes that were in our like first uh, 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 initial map. So like that one was perfectly fine to be on on top. But with our with this new like raster layer, that's just going to blanket over everything. So just simply drag it to the um, drag it all the way down underneath your stack. And then here we go. Now we need to do the thing that like Matt just said is increase the is is increase that transparency. So to do that, simply open up uh, the uh, the the um, our first layer again. Navigate to the symbology. Go to this layer rendering part and increase the and uh, decrease the opacity to about fifty percent. And now. Again, you can't really see it well on this display, but you have your underlying uh, street map corresponding to all of your uh, um, all of your actual like data, and you could potentially use this to drive to all these sites and actually fix the broken broken like Mooney meters. Fat chance, right? But you could if you wanted to. So, quick recap: all the things that we have done. So, we've imported our shape file, our first shape file of the five five. Um, five uh, heroes of New York. We have labeled and stylized that data set. We've imported a vector uh, point data of the 301 service request. We filtered and queried that data. We've stylized that point data. And then we've imported a raster base map uh, using the OpenStreetMap plugin. So the next case study, which is shorter, we're going to look at a, at, at a um, at a local case set that's from here at FSU. And uh, we'll also use um, 
a feature of QGIS called print layout uh, to export something that's actually done that lives outside of uh, the QGIS software. So in this study, we're going to be looking at data set that was provided to us by the very, very nice folks at FSU Facilities Planning and Space Management. Uh, thanks to them, they were incredibly forthcoming and nice and like, yes, here's all of our map data for campus. Go nuts. Um, so thank you very much to them. So this is the link to the data set that we'll be or like using, um, like again, you can just click on it, download it, uh, and save it somewhere convenient on your computer. And for this case study, we're going to be asking some questions. So we're going to look at how do different parts of F FSU campus rate for ADA parking, for accessibility, and for safety, and how can we represent this geospatially. So first, we'll import our um, buildings and street uh, Data. You can't see the streets now because the projector is bad, um, but um, we'll, we'll actually change that in a second. So, um, so these are just two different uh, layers as you can see here. You can see them both up on the top left of the screen here. Um, and uh, th so the street data here is actually a, a line data set, which we haven't sort of like worked or, or we haven't sort of or like work with that yet. So if we open up that attribute table, um, we can see that there's the first few rows, um, or, or here are the first few rows of the underlying uh, data um, for that, um, you know, for the um, for for all the streets around campus. So if we're thinking about questions related to safety, um, one of these columns might be good, and I would ask you to tell me which one it is, but I don't think you can read any of that out there. So I'm gonna tell you that it's speed. So that says speed, in case you couldn't tell. Um, so, so let's categorize and label this data um, uh, on its, on its uh, speed. So similar to how we created the color coding for the, um, for the five different sections of New York City, uh, we can create a categorized list for the street data uh, by, by, by using that speed sort of like column. So we'll also apply a color gradient. Um, and in this case, we'll be using grayscale uh, that correlates a like higher speed to a darker shade of gray. Um, we can also uh, adjust these properties of, or the, the sort of underlying features of the streets themselves so they look uh, sli uh, slightly thicker um, and are a bit more uh, uh, usable. So now, here uh, is our streets with our adjusted data. So um, note that although you don't necessarily need to know the specific speed limits of these, but if you know that the darker streets are the like faster ones. Uh, you can get a sense of like which streets are faster and which streets are p p potentially safe there, right? This is a good thing you'd probably want to know if you're thinking about like what are the like safest parts of campus for like ADA accessibility, for instance. So next, we'll add another shape layer, um, and this is uh, so now everything that's uh, the next layer. Hedges and Garnet, these are all of the like, parking facilities um, on campus. And so you, you see that there's a lot of these spread out all over campus. So let's dive into that attribute table um, and see if we, how, we can, um, how we can query this uh, to help address our research questions. So again, this attribute table is very extensive, um, but there are a few uh, fields and columns uh, that we can um, identify that directly pertain to questions of ADA accessibility. One is the kind of permit. Um, you know, we can say we want to filter out uh, parking areas that are like service only. Um, whether or not there's this helpful column here um, that lets us know whether or not a Kevin Lott has ADA spots in the in in the like, first place, and then finally, uh, this third column here um, has uh, data pertaining to how many ADA spots are in a given lot. So we're going to build a query, and the, I'm I'm sorry again that you can't see any of this. So for the permit, we'll use the uh, exclamation point equals operator, which does in fact mean not equal to. 
um, to say that we want to eliminate the like service lots uh, from our query. Um, next, we would we would we would we would use the and operator and say and ADA equals yes, and then one more and operator, and then we'll um, we'll say we you know only show me lots where the the number of ADA spots is greater than 10. And then if we test, we'll say that there are eight items. So we've gone from all of these like, parking structures down to eight. And these are those eight items that meet our criteria. So these are spots that are not service lots. They have ADA accessible spots and there are uh, 10 plus spots uh, in those lots. So we'll notice that probably this section of campus seems to have the, the seems to have the like most um, most of a concentrated ADA spots that meet or or, or the most concentrated parking structures that meet our criteria um, and if we look at that there's just a closer section of that campus and this is what we'll uh, work on exporting as our completed map um, so we'll start by adding some very clear labels um, we'll just import we'll make those labels using that like lot name column that we're importing from our attribute table. We'll also add some formatting, so we'll color them bright red, and we'll add um, a white, um, a like a white trim uh, to the text as well to help them stand out. Um, we can also import street names, which is pretty convenient if you have that data, um, uh, and we can make some collections here, uh, which is what the reds, the tour red circles are um, basically assigning uh, the street labels to like follow the curvature of the uh, lines. Um, and then we can see here that now we have our street names in addition to our, our clearly labeled uh, parking structures. So if we want to go about exporting this now, say we want to export this as part of a brochure or part of something else, uh, we would go to this thing called Print Layout in QGIS2. It's, it's called Print Composer. Uh, it's the same thing, just called two different things. Uh, and to do this, just simply go to uh, Project, New Print Layout, um, and then you'll be prompted to create a title, and then it's going to open up Print Layout in a new like window. Um, everything we've been doing so far has been in a single QGIS window, everything from here on out, um, there'll be two things open at the same time. Uh, nothing goes away per se, but it's just going to have you open up a new uh, print layout sort of like window. And this is what that looks like. Uh, to add the map that we were just looking on, just go to this add item, add map, and you would just drag your mouse from one corner of the screen to the other. Um, and there you go. It'll print the view um, of, uh, of, 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 of the like, map as it appeared in your canvas. So this, isn't, this, this doesn't always work 100% right the first time. You may have to try a couple of times. QGIS can be a little bit imperfect here. It is free and open source software, so this is one of the areas where uh, it's not perfect, but um, you may just need to sort of adjust the scale and things like that in the uh, item properties tag, which is that red circle there. Um, but you know, kind of troubleshoot, tweak it a few times, uh, and you can you can generally get it right. It 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 just might not be perfect the very first time. So once you get a map to your liking, you can add a label to it. Just simply add item, add label, draw your label. You can format it any way that you like. You can also had a legend uh, based on your attribute table. So like for here, um, I've included the like speed. Um, you can say, um, you can include information like about like, you know, like this shade of gray equals 10 miles an hour and this darker shade of gray means 20 miles an hour, things like that. So it kind of like automatically tries to like guess like what you would want your legend to be, but all that's completely customizable and adjustable. Um, and then finally, once you have everything to your liking, uh, you can export uh, your map as either a 
PNG and SVG or a PDF file, uh, depending on what your final uh, delivery platform is going to be. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, again, this here, these are the links to some like resources. Uh, there's a link again to this presentation. Um, the Linda course on using QGIS is pretty short when it comes to Linda courses. It's only like two hours long and it's actually very, very useful. Um, it does use QGIS too and you have access to Linda as a student. It comes with a pretty robust uh, data set too that you can use to kind of um, learn and, and, and explore experiment with, um, I would recommend it a lot. It's really good. Uh, the Adapolitan tutorial, which is everything uh, that we did first, um, there's there's a lot more there that they cover in are we doing things like with that data? Uh, the QGIS official documentation is good. It's long. It's like a 600 page PDF, but um, I wouldn't recommend you try to read that per se, but um, use it for like reference. There's a lot of good stuff in there. This thing, the Geospatial Historian is like an open, is an open access QGIS textbook. Um, it's mostly using like um, historical sources and historical maps, but it is a very well curated open access textbook. Lots of things there you might like, want to uh, use as well. Uh, QGIS Stack Exchange, y'all might be familiar with Stack Exchange. There's a whole QGIS subsection of that. Uh, if you've asked a question, chances are someone's asked a question too. Uh, the answers there are usually pretty high quality. And then of course the GIS Lounge. Uh, this is just like a general like um, website for like lots of things, stuff you can explore jobs, trainings, articles, new tools, new applications, all that good stuff as well. Um, again, here's our contact information. If you run into trouble using QGIS or you want to learn more, or you have specific questions, you know, uh, feel free to like reach out to us for consultations. That's what we're here for. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. All right. <laughs>